from day one at the table reading, you could not imagine anyone else playing any of those parts except the people at that table. I had just come off a television show called The Man from Atlantis, and it had just literally been canceled. They knew they were going to cancel it, so uh, my agent was finding scripts, and I had five scripts. I can only remember four of them, but Dallas was one. I was going to be the father of Lassie. That was the other one. Uh, speaking of Pioneers, the title of this show, there was a, a pilot for a show called Young Pioneers. Uh, with Linda Pearl, and I was going to be the husband on that, or at, I was going to read for the husband on that. All of these were potential. And Dallas, and I can't remember the fifth one. But my wife and I literally read all of them and thought, well, Lassie's a slam dunk cinch because everybody loves Lassie, and it's always done. And I thought, maybe I could do Lassie. And, thing. and we just, it really was like a pinwheel and go, oh, Dallas, let's try Dallas. And that was it. It wasn't based on isn't this going to be wonderful, and isn't the character of Bobby wonderful? No, was, I was panicked because I'd been out of work for a week, and literally, and I just wanted to make a choice, and we relied on our good, great fortune and picked Dallas. And then, you know, we got you know, the script reading at, at Warner Brothers, and I met Larry and Linda and Jim Davis and Barbara Belgettis and, and uh, Steve Canaley and Charlene Tilton. And I said, these are the best people in the world at, at the very first time we met. And it turned out to be magic casting and the most fundamentally important decision I ever made other than marrying my wife. The character, because of Leonard Katzman, who uh, became a mentor of mine ever since I met him the first day, and all through not only Dallas but step by step, I, he was my touchstone. And he went, uh, Bobby was going to die at the end of the fifth episode. And then it was going to be the character of Pam living in the South Fork Ranch with all of her arch enemies, et cetera, et cetera. And in a meeting at the networks, Leonard sat there, and he's old school producer, and he listened to everybody talking, and he, he said very quietly, why does she stay in the house? And they said, well, because. He said, he go, she just inherited like $100 million. Why is she living upstairs in a bedroom? And there was silence, and somebody in the room said, Maybe Bobby doesn't die. And there was my career. It quite literally is exactly how it happened, because I was going to be out after five episodes. That was before I ever found any of this out. By the time we had the five episodes, it was a continuing story with Bobby in it. But originally he was going to die, had it not been for Leonard. I have two points of view about that. One, the, the most logical answer is nobody knows, because if they did, there would have been ten of them. And there aren't and there weren't, and nobody actually came up to that level uh, ever in, in terms of the type of show it was. So my real guess is, and I mean this, is magic. It was magical casting. It was a magical time in U.S. history. There was the oil embargo. Reagan was president. It was all macho swagger. Uh, it was oil. It was everything, and it was magical casting. And when, when you think of Jim Davis and Barbara Bel Geddes as the matriarch and patriarch of a family, it's impossible to think of two other iconic figures that could pull that off. And then the ancillary cast, which we all were, uh, the ensemble, was accidental. It was just accidental casting. Um, and from day one at the table reading, you could not imagine anyone else playing any of those parts except the people at that table. And, and I think the audience got it. They got our relationship in, off camera, which I think is really important. Um, it allowed us to do anything on camera whatsoever because of the confidence we had in our friendship off camera. And, and the fact that Larry rose to the fore, which was not intended in the original premise of the show, but he found something in there that fit him like a glove. And from day one, when we saw that happening, the rest of the cast went, yes, this is going to be great, because we rode his coattails for 13 years. We were all grateful. We were all so, but it was because we were such good friends. Uh, you know, you relish the success of your friends. You, uh, you're jealous of the success of people who aren't quite as close to you. 
you know, I'm, I'm never jealous of family members who do well or my children doing well. Uh, but I look at some casting and films that I'm not in and I'm going, I could have done that better. You know? So it was something about our personal relationships that, that uh, nothing could have derailed that. Nothing could have derailed that. We got snockered at the table reading. But yeah, and, but Larry was. Larry's the Pied Piper. And he always has been that, uh, long before Dallas and long after Dallas, and now here Dallas again. Um, he has always been the marker by which we all know how far to go, how far not to go, uh, how to pull back, how to always do your work. Uh, we can have as much fun, especially Larry and myself, we can have as much fun as two people can possibly have as long as the minute the company needed the camera to roll, we could play our parts the way we're supposed to. And that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes people can't gather it back together. And uh, he was instrumental in establishing that. Originally, the show was uh, Romeo and Juliet. It was Bobby and Pam, Montagues and Capulets and all the big... <laughs> if that would have been the follow-through premise, uh, we'd have been down in two years. You know, the Dallas was never intended to be J.R. Ewing, this, you know, evil man you love to hate and hate to love and all of that stuff. So that was purely accidental. But once Leonard Katzman saw it, then they wrote to it. And that's when the ratings just went through the roof. Right. Yes. Take yes for an answer. <laughs> it is, no, it's tougher to write for the character wearing the white hat. Um, it's not that difficult to do. Um, the, the transition thing that I went through as an actor playing that character of Bobby was coming to grips with the fact that the types of things I was doing, I had to find the pleasure of doing internally as opposed to the pleasure that's on the page. Um, the pleasure that's on the page when you're a JR character or any of those characters, you're just, the world is your oyster. You can do anything. Um, and it's written that you do anything, and it's justified. Um, but Bobby's role as a character is the counterbalance to that. And, you know, and, you know I was an arrogant, egotistical young actor, fresh off my, starring in my own show as the single star of my own television show. And I had to adjust to that. I had, to, I had many meetings with Leonard Katzman in the cafe during the five-episode miniseries after work. Lenny... I know. How come I have to do this particular scene this way? I, it seems so weak. It seems so this. And Leonard would always, he was always very gracious. He would change some things, uh, never change the plot of the show or the direction of the character, but always trying to make me see the value of playing that character. And by the end of the fifth episode, I was happy to be Bobby Ewing, and I've been happy to be him, you know, for the past 30 years. What I discovered is two things. One is, which I didn't know till a while into the show, is Victoria purposefully took a step back from the ensemble nature of the show. And she says this in several interviews and, and has talked about it, that her outside definition as a character, the Pamela Barnes living in a Ewing house, that she was the outsider in terms of the characters of the show. And she decided, she made a conscious decision to not be in the circle all the time of, of the sort of behind the camera camaraderie so that she could maintain this character focus of being outside. Um, that being said, uh, again, I'm, I was the same arrogant, egotistical actor, you know, with every character so, because it was me. Um, that I always looked at the scenes we were in together, and, and I'd never directed before, and I was trying to understand the relationship visually and presentationally in terms of the show of how they were shooting Bobby and Pamela together and, and what that premise was, and the fact that she's drop-dead gorgeous, obviously, had a lot to do with it. And it was when I'd started directing. When I stepped back and started directing the show, I realized exactly why the characters were positioned the way they were, and I only wanted her to do a better and better and better performance for her own sake. And it completely evaporated. Every bit of competition that I felt I had with her or anybody else on the show 
completely evaporated. I, I so enjoyed directing, and I so enjoyed seeing them look better and better and better that I almost didn't care anymore about the character of Bobby because I knew they would always write the character the way they were going to. But it just became a, a show about everybody else, and it's been that way to this day. I just really love to see everybody better. And I don't mean better because they're bad. It's just when you're looking through or next to the lens and you're thinking, oh, this would be so much better if we just did. And that's what I was able to do. I was given a toy to play with. Uh, you know, I did 30 of them. And every time I would do it, I would find something that I felt made everybody a better part of whatever character they were without ever stepping on what their own opinion of, of what they should do was. So uh, it was really a passion of mine. Um, I don't quite uh, ponder those things, I think, to the, to the depth that himself does. Uh, but I think we had a huge influence. And the reason I not only think that, I actually know that, is that the influence maintains itself to this day. Uh, it maintains itself generationally. It, it defies common sense logic as to why this show has the international appeal that it does. Um, whether it's dubbed in another language uh, seems to make no difference whatsoever. Whether, whether people even, un if it's not dubbed and they don't understand the language, which has been in several cases where it's not dubbed in some foreign country, a small foreign country, so they watch it and they're just kind of trying to figure out who everybody is, but they love watching it. It is, again, it's magic. Um, and I think we did have an influence, sometimes not the best, but always uh, attractive. Um, we showed Americans to be quite uh, materialistic, uh, ruthless. Uh, that pretty well describes Larry's character. But we also were able to show, uh, you know, a, a moral compass, uh, a sense of right and wrong, a sense of equilibrium, and that was the Victoria characters of Pam and my character of Bobby. So there was always a balance. Uh, and if you only concentrate on one character, uh, you know, it's all about goody two-shoes and you miss the dynamic of the other side of the human being. So uh, we did a lot of stuff in terms of, uh, I think, the world's perception of a basic Americana trait. Uh, and, you know, I think over 50% of that trait is a good thing, so I have no problem with whatever the perception of Dallas was internationally. Well, Larry did the research on, on, on J.R.'s character, and what people don't understand is he lost more money in 13 years for the Ewing family, and Bobby actually made more money for the Ewing family, but everybody thinks that his ruthless character was just one success after another, but he had tankers going down and oil fields blowing up, and revolutions happening. That was great fun, great fun. <clears throat> it was an accidental, another accidental big deal, uh, and I don't know if Larry and Linda have, have addressed this or not, but Dallas was even popular before the Who Shot JR, to the extent that the networks kept coming back to the company mid-season and saying, could we have two more episodes? Could we have three more, four more episodes? Because they were making so much money on the show. So Leonard had scripted Dallas for that year, I think it was the end of the second year that he got shot. I'm very bad at this, but whatever year that was that he got shot, they had scripted up to, and let's say it was 24 episodes. And they knew the big cliffhanger at 24 was going to be something. And then the network said, we need two more episodes. And they went, ah, you know, you can imagine they've done this whole Bible of plot and everything. And they had to figure out what how to extend and have a cliffhanger in two more episodes. And that's when somebody in the room again said, well, let's shoot somebody. And the obvious choice was, let's shoot JR. Everybody wants to do it anyway. And that's how it happened. So they shot JR. He collapses on the floor, that iconic shot of him lying on the floor, freeze frame. We had three months hiatus, and then the actors went on strike. So the whole audience worldwide was counting on in three months knowing who shot JR, does he live or die? It really wasn't who shot JR, it was does he live or die? That was the real premise of the cliffhanger. The who shot happened after we started the following season and then we, I think, went about five episodes before we discovered who did it. But the real cliffhanger was does he live or die? So actors went on strike. The hiatus instead of three months was six months.
It was a it was huge. It was over a 90-day strike. Very, very unfortunate thing for the business. Very fortunate for Dallas. Um, and on top of that, so you have cliffhanger hiatus, actors on strike, and Larry says, if it's ever going to happen, I have to do it now. And he decided to renegotiate his contract, which takes a lot of nerve. Uh, you're only two years into a show. But he held out. He didn't report to work. And then, you know, the world knew that he was holding out. So if JR lives, is it going to be JR? Is that, so are they going to recast? It? it built up such a groundswell of interest that by the time we started the season, and he still wasn't at work, he missed the first episode. Um, by the time he got back to work and we started to address the who shot him then, the fact that he's alive, the entire world wanted to know the answer. And it took us to a level that most actors never get to experience, which is the level of, see you next year, when, when you reach the end of the season. We knew that we had a minimum four or five years of constant employment, no matter what. And it's such a benefit and a blessing for an actor to know that he's just done, I think by then we were doing 26, 28 episodes a season. We say goodbye and we say, we'll see you, you know, next September. We'll be back to work, and you know you've got a job. Well, the, the interesting thing to do Dallas in, and I came back, I think, in 87, it might have been. I think so. Um, there were minimal paparazzi. There were minimal you know, entertainment tonight shows. People weren't hounding and skulking and stalking and all of that. But there was enough interest in the fact that it, the press had come out that I was returning to the show of figuring out how. So Leonard had figured out that, that it was going to be a dream, that I had to come back. He knew the premise of the shower scene, etc. But he knew that in one sense you can't trust anyone because you have to trust everyone. And that's the impossible. If there's one person that will spill the beans, then you can't trust anyone. So instead of doing the shower on the set at MGM Studios and just deciding to do that, they got a completely different crew. The only people on the set that were from Dallas was Leonard Katzman, the producer, and our unit production manager, who was his nephew, so that was the connection, and myself. And we hired a commercial production company in Los Angeles to shoot an Irish Spring commercial. And we spent all day in the middle of a huge soundstage with a little tiny shower built right in the center, and I was wet and lathering up for about eight hours. And Leonard knew, because he had written the script, that all he needed was for me to turn to camera, which would be Victoria, turn to camera and go, good morning. But I would go, good morning, beat, beat, beat. And you can have a good morning too if you wake up like the Duffy family with Irish, and we do the whole commercial. And then Leonard, who was directing it, would say, you know, we didn't have enough foam on the, I they had to make it look like we were really shooting a commercial. Because if we just did one take and left, somebody would go, hmm. So we spent all day shooting a commercial for Good Morning. I still want to be a superhero. I've always wanted to swashbuckle. I'm, my buckle's a little lower and I can't swash anymore, but you know, it's everybody's dream to do that. And for your first job ever to be an underwater super strength superhero, um, it was the best first job you can possibly imagine. And quite interesting is uh, Warner Brothers has now released the four movies and the 13 episodes we did of The Man from Atlantis on DVD, and it was their second highest rated uh, DVD release. So again, there's some little mini iconic thing about that particular time in television. It was in the 70s. We did it in 76. There weren't a lot of superheroes, uh, at that point, modern superheroes. So uh, it filled this niche. And I get people coming up to me your age who will say, I tried to swim like you did. I'd get in the pool and do the whole thing. And then they start talking about Dallas. But it has a place in TV history as well. <laughs>